Hello, my wonderful, beautiful friends. Welcome back to r slash I don't work here, lady, where you'll hear stories about people mistaking regular Joe Schmoes as employees. And nobody knows how it happens, but it does, guys. So strap yourselves in because today's episode is another super entertaining one. I hope you guys enjoy the stories today and do remember to hit that subscribe button for future tales. Let's dive in. So I'm a disabled, overweight, and scarily ugly looking woman. I am into wood art, and generally doing DIY at my home in Scotland. I am also an army veteran. Due to a back injury I sustained in the military, I can't walk more than a few meters, so I get around on a mobility scooter. Now, the DIY store I go to wears orange. I go there fairly often, often enough that I know where many things are. On this day, I was dressed in jeans, a print top that had flowers on it, and slip-on shoes. No orange anywhere. I was down in the electrical aisle looking for the right light switches and sockets for the remodel that I'm doing in my hallway at home. I pick one up every now and then to match with a color swatch I've brought to see how they look. Now, also in the aisle is an old man. I'd say he's probably in his 80s. He's looking at the shelves, but seems rather confused. Being nice, I ask him if he's okay. That's mistake number one. He tells me he's looking for an adapter so he can charge his electric toothbrush. Now, I know exactly what he needs, and I show him exactly where they are. That's mistake number two. He then smiles and gives me a grateful, thank you, and off he goes, happily with his adapter in hand to the tills. At this point, I'm feeling good. I've helped somebody out. So then I go back to my own shopping, or at least I try to, when I hear another, excuse me, I turn around to see a young man with a handful of different switches. He asked, which one of these should I use for an internal switch for an external light? Now, I look excited with being able to help. That's mistake number three. I point to the one that has a light on it, so you can see when the switch is on. I told him I'd use that one, so you'd know if the light is on or off if you can't see the light itself. He smiles happily, dumps all the other switches on a shelf, and starts looking at other items on the shelves. So now I go back to my own shopping, or at least I try to, again. And now enters Karen. She says, excuse me? Now, mistake number four is that I reply. She says, where do I find that stuff to put on walls to fix a hole? I told her it's down the other end of the store, somewhere near the painting supplies, somewhere near the tills. She replies, yeah, but where and which shelf? I told her, I'm not sure, just take a look down there. A member of staff might be able to help you better. She then says, I need you to show me. I just watched you help two people. I told her, sorry, but you gotta go look down there. I'm about to pay for my shopping, but you need to show me. I don't know the right stuff. I told her, look down there. There's a big banner by the right aisle. There might be someone there who can help you. Karen says, but you work here. I just saw you helping two people. It's your job to help customers. Now show me where it is and what I need. Now at this point, I'm getting pretty annoyed. I told her it's not my job. I don't work here. Am I wearing an orange apron? I start trying to roll my scooter forward towards the tills. And Karen, faster than a speeding bullet, steps in front of my path only an inch or two in front of me. Now, these scooters are fairly heavy and solid, and they won't take damage from hitting an ankle. There was absolutely nothing I could do to stop quickly enough. And Karen shrieks. She says, Ow! You hit my leg! You tried to run me over! And then the tears flow. Her shriek has alerted a couple of staff members who come running. She says, She tried to run me over! I want the manager, I want the police, I want an ambulance, I want her fired and arrested. Then, a mature looking man in a suit with a large orange badge with the word manager on it comes running up, also alerted by the shriek and shouting, and he asked what happened. Karen says, your assistant in the lazy cripple chair, and yes, she really did call it that, tried to kill me. I want her arrested, fired, and I'll sue the store for my injuries. The manager asked, what assistant? This lady doesn't work here. She does, and she tried to run me over. Check the cameras. My ankle is most likely broken. Now, I want to note that she's still standing, stomping around, shouting, and generally not behaving like somebody with a broken ankle. Maybe like a spoiled toddler, though. I told the manager, she asked me where something was, I told her where to look, she got demanding and behaved like a spoiled child, and then deliberately stepped in front of me when I tried to leave. There was no way I could have stopped in time. Karen shrieks, Liar! You do work here! I saw you helping two other people! Him! She then points at the young man who stopped to watch the commotion. 
I told her, yeah, I helped out of the goodness of my heart because I'm a nice person. That doesn't mean I work here. The manager then says, yeah, she doesn't work here. Let's go back to the office to talk about this. Then we'll see what needs doing. Karen then responds, yeah, and then you'll call the police and an ambulance and fire her. So off we go to the office. Karen remembers her broken ankle and starts to put on a deliberate limp on the wrong leg. She's moaning all the way to the office about her broken ankle and how painful it is for her to walk. In the office, the manager invites Karen to sit. He then says, let's start with the CCTV and see what happened. He then turns the CCTV around so we can all see it. He presses some buttons and then runs the video back to where I ride into the aisle. I'm seen looking at the products. I'm seen talking to the old man. I'm seen taking him to a shelf and passing an adapter to him. I'm then seen talking to a young man and pointing at a product in his hands. I'm seen talking to Karen and pointing down the store. And she's seen looking angry, with fists clenched, talking to me. Then the camera catches me moving off. She's seen rushing past me and deliberately stepping in my path, where I obviously don't have time to stop. The manager looks at her and says, Just so you know, I'm a retired police officer. Do you really want the police and an ambulance? Your ankle is clearly not broken and it's clear what happened. Do you really want to get charged for wasting police time? Or will you just leave the store and not come back? Karen began to say something, but then the manager said, Really? And Karen wilted. She stands, with no sign of a limp, and walks out with a member of staff escorting her out. I was thanked for my patience and handed a gift card for your trouble. I paid for my wares using the gift card, which covered the whole cost, plus some more credit remaining on the card for my next visit. I may not help anyone next time though. Thank goodness for CCTV guys, Karen's worst enemy. I don't know what the heck she was thinking following the manager to the office to review the footage though. Any other person would have realized their little charade was up and simply left the store. Not Karen though, she likes to hold her ground and get embarrassed. So, quite some time ago, my girlfriend and I moved in together, and we had set up all the things. Cable, internet, phone, etc. We got our home phone number, our two cell phones, and we were off to the races. Almost immediately, we started to get phone calls for an establishment that does custom framing and various other art-related things. Let's call them Expo for Art. Of course, we had caller ID, and we had friends that would call us. But inevitably, if we didn't recognize their number, it was someone wanting to find out if their order was complete, their frame was done, what the hours were, or any of a thousand other questions. Now, I'm sure anybody else who's had this happen to them will recognize this exchange. It starts with, sorry, that's no longer their number. This is a residence. Yeah, I'm sure. No, I'm not giving you my address. No, I don't know their new number. Yes, I have a phone book, but so do you. Eventually, after a thousand of these, we decided to change the message on our answering machine. It said, This is not, I repeat, not Expo for Art. If you were trying to reach Expo for Art, please hang up, look up their number, and try that, because we aren't them. Eventually, I got my gazillionth call, and I asked the person on the other end where they keep getting the number. They said, Well, it's on the receipt. I guess I'll just call this other number. I asked them to give me the other number, and I called it. Somebody picks up and says, Hello, Expo for Art. I told them you guys are still giving out my home phone number on your receipts. He responds, Yeah, so? Well, stop it. It's been at least a year since you guys haven't had that number. At least cross it out or something. The guy then said, That's a pain in the ass. I'm not making my employees do that. So, you're the manager. He replied, I'm the owner. So I get his name, and let's call him Fred. I said, Fred, you have decided that it's too inconvenient to cross my home phone number off your receipts, so you're just gonna keep giving it out? He says, yep, what are you gonna do? Sue me? I then called a lawyer after that, but I didn't really have a leg to stand on. I went to the store and asked for Fred. They told me that Fred's not here, he's hardly ever here. Do you want me to call him? I told the person, I know this is gonna sound odd, but is there any chance I can see one of your receipts? She picks up a receipt book and shows it to me, and sure enough, it's got my phone number at the top, above another one. I then tell her, I thought so, I couldn't get you at the other number, and some guy yelled at me, so I had to come down here. She told me, yeah, we've been having that happen a lot, ever since Fred decided that we didn't need two phone lines, but he just bought like 20 boxes of these receipt books and business cards, and he's too cheap to buy more until they run out. I'd hate to be that guy. I told her, yeah, that's gotta suck. So then I went home and hatched my evil plan. 
The next phone number I didn't recognize, I answered. Hello, Expo for Art. Hi, uh, this is Mary Smith. I dropped off a thing last week to be framed. Is it ready? I told her, let me check. Mmm, yeah, we finished it this morning. Now, I hope you don't mind, but we decided to upgrade the matting because of the weight of the piece. It's the same color though, and we won't be charging you for it, since it was my decision. Mary says, oh, thank you. I'll be down to pick it up later today. What time do you guys close? Now, at this point, I look down at the business card with my number, and the hours clearly marked 11 o'clock to 4 o'clock. I said, take your time. I'll be here until 7 o'clock. She then says, thank you so much. Can you tell me how much that was? $19.99, ma'am, plus tax, so $21.39. Wow, that's cheap. Are you sure? Of course, I'm giving you a special discount. If anybody has a problem, tell them you talked to Fred. She says, okay, see you at 6 o'clock. And I said, see you at 6. Thank you for calling Expo for art. Now, for weeks, I just kept giving out random information. How much is a 36 inch by 48 inch matted frame? I would tell them it's $24.99. And they would say, wow, that's cheap. How much to have it done custom? I would tell them custom is an extra 10 bucks, so $34.99. And they would say, wow, that's cheap. I'll be right down. What's your name? Fred. Okay, Fred, see you in 10 minutes. Now, I can only imagine the number of pissed off people who showed up to pick up orders that weren't ready, and when they finally were, they were given a price way higher than what Fred had told them over the phone. Eventually, somebody did let it slip that they called the number on the receipts, and that's what Fred had told them. And Fred was not happy. He called me furious. I said, Hello, thank you for calling Expo for Art. This is Fred. You are not Fred. I'm Fred. Are you trying to put me out of business? Why Fred? Whatever do you mean? Listen, someone's been giving prices to my customers and telling them their orders are in when they're not due for weeks. I know it's you. Well, Fred, who called them? Nobody called them. They called us. I then asked, then what's the problem? If someone called you and got pricey information, that would seem to be your problem. They didn't call me, you idiot. They called you. <laughs> well, how would that happen? Your numbers on the receipts and business cards. I then told him, my, my, Fred, it seems there's a very simple solution here. Take my number off your receipts and your business cards. I hear him grunting over the phone. His teeth were clenched. He was so angry. He says, Do you have any idea how much promotional materials cost? Now, Fred, is it more than it costs you to do these jobs for the prices you're quoting? Is it more than it costs to lose customers or less than that? He then screams at me saying, This is extortion. I told him, Call it what you want, Fred. The choices and consequences are entirely up to you. So a week later, Fred calls back and I answered, Hello, Expo for Art, this is Fred. He then screams at me that he's ordered new receipt books and cards, and can you please stop? I told him, sure, bye Fred. Oh my friends, what an incredible I don't work here story. Definitely one of my favorites in a long time. I can't believe he refused to tell his employees to just scratch out the number that's no longer in service. That would have been the easiest way to solve this problem. But nope, Fred had to learn the hard way. Opie handled that absolutely beautifully. Hospital food is not crunchy. For whatever reason, none of it has a good, satisfying crunch. The crunchiest thing they seem to have is raisin bran, and that just doesn't do the trick. So after a week of being held captive by tubes and wires, I was ready for food that was actually satisfying to chew. Finally discharged, I stopped off at the Humongo chain grocery store for my craving. Don't judge, but all I wanted was a bowl of corn checks and freezing ice-cold milk. So with a hand basket containing my crunchy treat, I was rifling through the milk section, looking for the coldest jug with the latest expiration date they had, when she lit up my life in exactly the same way that a swarm of locusts blots out the sun. She was wearing some kind of dark, expensive-looking pants and a white silk blouse with draping folds that just screamed, I have more money than you. I was bending over, head stuck in the cooler, and all I could hear her talking about was how we were out of some organic, grass-fed, free-range, no-hormone, royal cow's milk. Now, I think that stuff sells for around 12 bucks a gallon, and is in a different section of the store. At any rate, I'm not in that section. I don't work there, and I don't care about her, so I just ignore her. That's a big mistake. So on her part, 
Suddenly, I have a snake hissing in my ear the words, you will look at me when I'm talking to you, and my wrist is grabbed and pulled. Now, I had just been released from a week at the hospital where I was on, among other things, a heparin drip. Blood thinner, constantly fed through an IV tube that had been taped to my wrist, exactly where she was now grabbing me. Now, the tube had been taped down, and while I ripped off the bandages before I left the hospital, there was still some significantly sticky tape gunk in that area. And what else might stick to tape residue? How about fingers? She grabbed my wrist and yanked my arm up, but her fingers happened to stick to the skin a bit, resulting in two things. One, the sensation of her getting some pine sap on her skin, and two, my skin being twisted far more than she expected. Not that she would have cared anyway. The twisting and pulling of the skin released a little bit of blood from the IV area. Just a couple of drops, not really a big deal. But it was enough that when she felt the sticky gunk on her fingers, she instinctively wiped her hand on her sleeve, leaving a small trail of blood on that field of spotless white. You know how some people can pass out at the sight of blood? I mean, I don't, but she sure did. She dropped like a sack of potatoes, and that's when the staff started to run up. Typical shouts of what happened, call an ambulance, followed with Milady regaining consciousness within a couple of minutes, and starting to scream about how I, the store employee, had thrown blood on her, clawing at her blouse and going into absolute hysterics. Store security arrived and was glaring at me menacingly, demanding to know what I had done. Fortunately, I had an ace just a few inches up my sleeve. An ace, which I played, as I said. The lady grabbed me and it really hurt. Now, the thing about heparin is that it's the only drug that can go into that specific IV site. I needed many other IVs in the hospital, so I had another IV site just a few inches up my arm, where they had been injecting all kinds of other things. And that site looked ugly. A bruise the size of a silver dollar, brown and yellow and green, as if a parrot had binged on tricks and lucky charms, and then threw up in the ball pit at Chuck E. Cheese. It was previously hidden under my sleeve, and now I made sure it wasn't hidden and displayed that bruise of honor. Like how a middle-aged man displays a trophy yoga instructor in his convertible. I told them, she grabbed my arm because I wasn't paying attention and yanked, and she left this bruise and it really hurts. Now that coupled with a hospital armband that I hadn't cut yet, that was all I needed to turn the tide of opinion to my favor. I gave a statement to the police who eventually arrived, and told them I wanted to press charges. I then got my milk and headed for the door. A few days later, I received a call from a detective, or a prosecutor or somebody, and they told me they had come to a plea agreement of some kind. And if I wanted to write out a victim impact statement, to have it within a week. I told them that as long as something went on her record, I was fine. The crunch was indeed satisfying. Definitely served her right. I'll never understand why people think it's okay to grab workers, or random people. Keep your hands to yourselves. And that, my friends, brings us to another end of our slash I don't work here, lady. Guys, thanks for coming to hang out with me today and listening to these wacky stories. If you missed the last episode of our slash I don't work here, lady, I will link it right here. OP pretends to be a store manager to fire a Karen. And this story is absolutely hilarious. So check it out if you haven't, and I'll see you guys in the next one. I love you.